This morning, I'm very, very excited to talk to you about real world smart city. Hashtag not Contoso. And what we're gonna do, and I'm, what I'm gonna walk through this morning with you, is really looking at how a specific city, uh, this city is Richmond, Virginia, took advantage of the Microsoft Cloud and all the goodness of what the cloud has to offer, from Azure to Dynamics 365 and the advanced workloads in Azure, Cognitive Services, IoT Hub, Embedded Power BI, Service Bus, Bots, Run DMC. No. <laughs> but it's all gonna be goodness. And hopefully you walk away with a lot of ideas and things that you can do for your organization. I've been a Microsoft Regional Director in the last couple of years and also an MVP in the last uh, uh, nine, 10 years now and been really privileged to be working with a lot of you know, great minds around the world. I live and work in Washington, DC. Uh, we have the best reality show in the world today. And uh, I, I do enjoy working a lot with government organizations. So I work closely with, with the US government and also privileged to be working with a lot of the European governments around the world, from the federal level to the city level, and even the uh, councils and police. Um, in fact, I was just in Belgium meeting with a lot of government officials and government organizations in the last two days. So with that, let's jump into our conversation here and start looking at how we can accelerate citizen services with Azure. So what we're going to cover today is really four key points. Number one is look at the landscape of citizen services and what it means for government to be proactive. Second, I'll quickly show you what the city of Richmond, Virginia is doing today with the power of the cloud and how they're better serving their citizens. And then I'll talk about why Azure is a phenomenal platform for any government agency to take advantage of. And then last but not the least, I'll deconstruct the solution that uh, uh, the city of Richmond is using called AppPoint Citizen Services. So if we look at the landscape today, right? Despite the fact that we live in a world where everybody's mobile, we're using the greatest technology, we can talk to Siri, yet government services fall short. For example, let's say you're in your neighborhood, you saw a, a, a pothole or a tree that fell down, or a bridge that's broken, how do you tell your government about it, your local council about it? What do you do? Pick up the phone and call. Did you just watch Captain Marvel, right? It's like so 90s. A WhatsApp, okay, that's cool. But in most cases, even with WhatsApp, yeah, you report, hey, the bridge is broken, and then what? In fact, I hate to say this, if you see some issues in your local town, local city, in your government, what do you do? You just complain on Facebook, right? My city sucks. And then the irony of this, it's not that the city doesn't wanna help. I'm not saying that the government is not doing their job, but they just don't know. There's no effective ways for them to receive the information. And not only once they receive the information, what happens? There's no appropriate and effective mechanism to route because if the pothole is broken, maybe public works will take care of it. If the tree is down, what? Park services has to deal with it. Like, how do we route all these issues? And once these issues are routed, how do we track what's being done? Y'all with me? I mean, we as consumers, we're so used to the fact that we can order stuff on Amazon, track the package, and know when it's coming to our door front. Or even worse, I don't know if you guys do it here in the US with Domino's Pizza, I can order the pizza and see the pizza being made and see where the car is until I get the pizza. All right? I don't know if that's good or bad, <laughs> but that's the new norm. Yet our government is not there. Now there's a lot of reasons for this, right? But more and more, the demand of public services are growing. 7.3 billion worldwide are on mobile, and this stat was from last year. It's more than that now. Everybody's embracing social. I have uh, two kids. My son's 13. His name is Johannes. My daughter's name is Danica. She's eight. And when I start talking about, yeah, Facebook, they're like, what's Facebook? Apparently, 13-year-olds today, they don't use Facebook. They don't even use Snapchat anymore. 
You know, the latest thing is Insta stories and TikTok. Right? Trying to keep up here. But the government's never there. At the same time, we're also concerned, both the public and the government, about data breaches. And this is a valid concern, right? One of the feedback that I get a lot working with government is like, oh, we don't want to use the cloud. It's not secure. Or we don't, we don't want to use modern technology. Paper is more secure, right? Which is unfounded. And then lastly, and this is the biggest issue in which I agree with, cost. Government budget are shrinking, yet the demands are rising. In the past, to have a sophisticated citizen services platform, it costs a lot of money. But thanks to the cloud, it doesn't have to cost that. So government today must be responsive. We can't just sit around and wait until really bad things happen. In fact, with modern technology, we can engage citizens and we can provide a better lifestyle and promote a better society where we live in. Now, just a quick show of hands. Who works for a government agency here? Right, very good. Who works to support government agencies? All right, a couple of us. Who worked or who lives in a place where you have government? <laughs> Right? Point being is, we all should be concerned and we all should be accountable for this. So, the good news is technology is transforming public services. So, these are just some of the stats, and I'm not going through these in details, but long story short, it can be done. And that's the fun and exciting part. So, imagine a world where we can optimize operations and engage citizens. Not only we provide an effective way for our citizens to report issues they're dealing with, request for a permit, com uh, uh, put in a noise complaint because the neighbor's too loud with modern technologies. But what if we could be proactive as well? What if the government can listen into ways and not wait for my good friend Andrew here to report there's a, a pothole, but ways will self-report to the government? Or maybe that street lamp is an IoT device. As soon as a bulb goes off, it will self-report, come fix me. Or maybe even better, with the power of AI machine learning, with the data we've collected, it can tell the government, hey, you know what, next week, those three street lights will go bad, go fix it. Is that cool? Docs, that's a pipe dream. That's like sci-fi. No, it's here today, I'm gonna show you. So, before I walk through the solution, I want to show you the end result of a city in the U.S. called Richmond, Virginia. It's one of the oldest cities in the U.S. Uh, Richmond, Virginia is in the south, and it's, it's a nice, uh, wonderful city. And what's really impressive is the city is very forward-thinking in serving their citizens, despite the, sh the shortage of resources and what they did is they maximized the Microsoft Cloud to provide better citizen services. So let's check out a quick video of what they've done. Right, so now uh, uh, citizens can access not only through phone, but through uh, apps as well as an online portal, our citizen portal. They can look up uh, any request that is public um, uh, online or through their app. They can look at their specific requests. They can see uh, the status of any public request as well as uh, the, um, as well as any comments by city uh, employees. And uh, we now do about 150 different services that are accessible uh, um, uh, through the system as well as additional services that you can get through uh, calling for information. That's pretty cool. Tower so so here's, here's the background of the story, and I want to show you what we ended up with, and then I'll show you how this was built. So just like any government organization, the city of Richmond, at one point in time, didn't have an effective way to capture non-emergency requests. And when I say in the U.S., emergency requests goes through a system called 911. For non-emergency, it's 311. So you have to pick up your phone and call 311, right? And obviously nobody, not a lot of people would do that. So they embark on this journey 
to figure out how can they better serve their citizens and reach their citizens through the channels the citizens look at. Mobile is one. Now, did they kill phone? No, they kept the phone calling. They also made texting available. And the idea was is they want to empower citizens to report if they have any non-emergency service issues. There's a mobile app, and later I'll show you the mobile app, but this is their website. It's a public website, rva311.com. Any one of you can go. So it looks very simple. Uh, this is tied to the city website, but in its simplest form, what you can do through the app or through the uh, browser interface, you can request for a new service, new sign, new road, new tree, very simple, or you can report issues, right? Repair basin, missing uh, stormwater, manhole cover, what have you. Uh, you can, let's see, even tax, delinquent collections, personal property. So I'm sure a lot of you would relate to this. These are services your local city or government would typically provide. And what they did is they took five agencies join them to use this service. And they're gonna introduce more services as they uh, integrate other agencies. So the idea is if a, once a citizen reports, it's gonna route to the right, and I'll show you the back end in a second, it's gonna route to the right agency, but here is the cool part, right? Not only can the citizen track what they requested, the mayor said, you know what? We want to be a very transparent city. All requests will be made public. That's actually pretty bold, right? So now anybody can go up to the website and view all requests. I mean, look, look at the time, right? 3.45 a.m., sofa and alley for bulk pickup. Somebody drop off a sofa somewhere. Then, I mean, look at that. And then you can click on and look at the detail, right? Let's look at this large pothole. Um, there you go, it, it zeroes in on the location, it tells the details, and certainly, it has a way to detect if there's similar reports, so it avoids any type of duplicates. You get the idea. Isn't this cool? And this is all in the cloud. Now, as we think about this, right, this wouldn't have made possible and cost effective if it were not for the cloud. The big part of this technology is powered by Microsoft Azure. And why Azure? A lot of you most likely already know what Azure is, the background is, but let me just highlight why Azure is the backbone and the foundation of this solution. First and foremost, which is important for government, is Azure or Microsoft, to, uh, you know, just to generalize this, Microsoft has the most global data centers around the world. One unique aspect of working with government organization is data sovereignty. Y'all with me? And that is important. So if there are certain restrictions and requirements where the solution needs to sit in the local uh, data center, Microsoft can provide that. Second, Microsoft has the only hyperscale cloud. And what that means is regardless of what services, it can scale to the volume that you need or not in certain cases. And it meets the most complex Worldwide compliance standards. Did you know the Microsoft Cloud has the most certifications and, and standards approved uh, cloud platform compared to all the other providers? Um, designed to exceed government requirements and supports a broadest set of services, tools, and languages. And as you know, you could do any which uh, setup you want, be it hybrid, intelligent, trusted, and productive. So these are just some of the standards in certifications that the Microsoft Cloud has, right? Now, that is very important to government organizations. Even though you can come up with this cool solution and whatnot, but it doesn't meet the fundamental governmental requirement around compliance and standards and data sovereignty, your cool solution doesn't matter. Next, beyond what Azure can offer, at least the base services, right? So a lot of people think, especially working with government, I find like the maturity varies. There are some organizations that think, oh, the cloud is just, you know, killing our data centers and moving all our VMs in the cloud, right? I mean, that, you can do that. Run virtual machines, run storage. 
But to me, the exciting part of the cloud are the advanced services that you can't do on premises. Things like cognitive services, bots, IoT Hub, Service Bus, uh, Cosmos DB. And the needs and requirements of governments are becoming more and more complex. And that's why Azure is a no-brainer, especially with the advanced workloads it offers. So what's AppPoint Citizen Services? So I work for a company called AppPoint. We are a software provider. We build software on top of the Microsoft Cloud. Um, we have a lot of solutions around migration, governance. And what's exciting too is we have a lot of solution that's focused on industries leveraging the Microsoft Cloud. One of the solutions we have is AppPoint Citizen Services. And this was created as a need for a lot of government organizations. Our government customers in the past would tell us, Docs, we would love a solution that can help our citizens, help us to be more proactive, but it just costs too much money, right? Especially in on-premises days. So the idea of citizen services, number one, citizens can easily report incidents. I'll show a demo of this. Number two, once this, um, uh, another way incidents can be reported through IoT, sensors can self-report as well for any issues. Uh, case response time can be accelerated because the workflow is much more efficient. There's transparency and accountability. And then on the government side, you know, this is just a showcase of all the technologies that's uh, a part of citizen services. The government side, they could be more proactive and be more transparent to keep citizens informed and engaged. And then from an analytical perspective, reporting perspective, key stakeholders can have insights to how they're performing and what issues they're dealing with. Now, how can you get citizen services? So in case you're not familiar, are you guys familiar with AppSource, Microsoft AppSource? All right, only one. So Microsoft AppSource is a phenomenal marketplace that Microsoft has. Think of AppSource as like your app store on your mobile phone. The difference with AppSource, unlike traditional Microsoft marketplaces, when you come to AppSource, what you're gonna find are focused solutions. You're not gonna come here and find you know, Office 365 E1 or E3, right? What you're gonna, when you come to AppSource, you'll find the right app for your business, and it's very specific to an industry. You see uh, optimization, platform. So let's, let me look for citizen services. So I search citizen services, there you go. And the idea here is any customer can come, you know, look at it, look at screenshots, learn about it, and try it. When they try it, it's a fully functional solution, good for, I believe, 14 to 30 days, depending on the solution. And you can start working on it. And the cool part about this trial experience with AppSource, it's so streamlined that as soon as I hit free trial, right, I give Microsoft permission, blah, 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 continue. As soon as I do that, so I pre-did that during, uh, before we started, it goes ahead and provisions a demo tenant. This demo tenant is in Azure. And it has a demo, it hooks it hooked into a Dynamics tenant as well, Dynamics 365. And then it only takes five to 10 seconds for it to provision. Y'all follow me so far? Once it's provisioned, it'll send you an email, you know, welcome for trying out citizen services. Here are some instructions, but just to show you quickly, you will have uh, access to two portals. The first portal is what's called the internal portal. Think of citizen services as a self-service solution that you don't really need coding. You can come here and start configuring how you want your citizen services to be. So for example, I provisioned it. First and foremost, you know what? Let me, um, let me go to configuration. Let me update my site settings, right? So I can update the logo, I can update you know, the color scheme, the layout. So think of it like Office 365. When you create a new Office 365 tenant, 
you can define the services, set up the email, you know, same idea. And in addition, I can also configure the services as well. So there you go. Uh, I want to change the logo. I can change it. Uh, so let, let's do a quick example here. No, we're not in. Sorry, I was in Brussels the other day. Um, okay, so I'll just pick that. All right, uh, okay, save that there, save, okay. So I'll change the logo, just do something simple here for everyone. Now obviously there's a ideal size. Um, I didn't pick the right size, so it might look a little off here. That's fine, but a little stretch, but that's okay. Um, or maybe, I, let's use this, yeah, that's fine, okay. So, and you can do that, you can change color, so you get the idea, you can change the layout, what have you, so, so that's one. The next thing is I can also configure services. Now, what do we mean by services? Remember earlier when I went to Richmond, RVA 311, there's different kinds of services, new requests, pothole, everybody with me? So as a city or a local government agency, you can go and configure the services you want to offer. And once you configure these services, you can define the workflow as well. So, you know, abandoned building, so I can, these are some samples. Obviously, you can change, you can uh, uh, hide, and you can add new ones. You can edit layout. You can add a new service request. And then you can define the workflow. Who will get the alert and all that good stuff. Yeah. Now, once it's done, let's say I went through all this. Once it's done, here is the public-facing portal, the citizen portal. So here's the public-facing. By the way, there's an app that comes with this too. Once they deploy, there's instruction on here, the app store. You know, the citizens can download it and they'll have a mobile app for their city or their town or their county. And then they can go ahead and request service, right? So it's very simple, straightforward. Now, how would a citizen report? So I want to walk you through an example. So I'm going to walk through the example and then I'll show you the back end on how uh, the use case looks like. So let's say you want to report a graffiti because some mysterious person started drawing on the wall. My name is Ducks C, not Bank C. So how would a citizen report? So let's watch this video. So I recorded a short video on my, uh, using a phone on how a citizen would report. Imagine a government agency, uh, let's say city of Chicago, deploy this solution, and the solution would have essentially two components. The first component, they would make available an app for citizens to use if they're using mobile device. Obviously, this is cross-platform, cross-device. They can use their computers as well. So let's say I'm walking down the road, and um, I notice there's a graffiti. And being a good citizen of Chicago, I want to report that you know, there's, there's a graffiti there. So I, I could go to the app, but what I'm showing you right here, obviously, is through Safari. It's uh, HTML5, very responsive. And I want to report a graffiti. There you go. So as soon as I select that, it tells me some details about the graffiti. By the way, this is fully configurable by the government agency. They can define the different non-emergency services they want to put in. It could be a graffiti, a pothole, broken tree lamp, any type of case management service they want to provide to their citizens can be made available. So as I hit continue, now it's going to look at my location through the GPS of my device. Obviously, I can put some information. OK, I saw graffiti in a storefront. It's brick. And as you can see, there's different options on the dropdown, which it's easily customizable by the customer. And when I say customizable, no programming, no development needed. It's self-service, configurable, and easy to deploy. And um, let me put some description here. Found, let me see, Bank C. <laughs> All right, is vandalizing the wall. Okay, and then 
In this scenario, it picked up uh, our location here in uh, Orlando, but um, let's just say this is somewhere in Chicago that I saw it, and I have all this information, and I took a picture already in the interest of time, and you could take pictures as well. So this is, I caught Banksy in the act. There you go. And you, I can upload multiple types of pictures and information, and then uh, I can even upload other types of attachments, and let me hit submit. So as soon as I hit submit, friends, what happens? This case or this information has now become a case and it's submitted, Dynamics 365 picks it up. So as soon as I submit it, it gives me details. I have a request number. I can even track all my requests and view all my requests. And then what happens next? It gets submitted. The specific government agency picks it up. And then... So as you can see, right? The mobile experience very straightforward, and certainly, again, you can the city or the town or the county can customize it to their color. Now, one of the things I want to highlight too, while the solution sounds like it's for a city, I'm sure some of you are thinking, wait, 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 I can use this for another use case. You know, I was speaking with uh, somebody earlier. Uh, she works at a university. We're working with a big university in the U.S. to make this available for campuses as a um, student services solution. We're working with a military agency for military bases, for base services. Because at the end of the day, these are many cities as well. They have the same needs. So once it's submitted, what happens? So once the issue is created, a case will be created and assigned. And going back to the internal portal, so if I go back to the internal portal, there is a section for request. Uh, request management, there's a uh, couple options. Obviously, you can add users, your internal users, which agency can have access to this. And it is security trimmed. If you add the agency, when they log in, they won't have admin view, meaning they won't see things they're not supposed to see. And when they log in, they get alerted. They log in, they'll see all the requests that's intended for them. So we see all these requests. Uh, they can look at the details and then in addition, they can put their own requests and they can even assign um, the request to a specific dispatcher. So feel, uh, first line workers, their colleagues out there who's, who need to take care of this. And once it's assigned to the dispatcher, later I'll show you what the view looks like. Uh, the dispatcher uh, can go and take care of the work, take pictures, pull, put notes, pull in data, so meaning if they need to put a, a checklist or a video on how to do certain things, they can pull those and optionally tap into other sources like Office 365, Stream, OneDrive, etc. Yeah. What do you guys think so far? Helpful? Now, once, once a, a case will be created and assigned, so I kind of walk you through this, The back end, some of you may be wondering, what's the back end of this? I mean, sure, that portal looks so simple and all that, but what's keeping all this together? So to break it down technically, you know, the portal is a web front end sitting in Azure. The actual cases are tracked and uh, stored in Dynamics 365. In Dynamics 365, can the internal user log in directly? Absolutely. I mean, you can log in and you can do it there, but in the spirit of making it simple and seamless, the internal user, they don't really have to go to Dynamics 365. That's why there's that internal portal. You can obfuscate Dynamics 365 from the uh, government user if you want to. But in reality, Dynamics 365 is taking care of it in the back end. And uh, notice that you can track all the work orders for the field as well. And in Dynamics 365, there's a cap capability called field services. The idea with field services, it's intended for work orders and work management. Anybody use field services before? So, all right. But this is a great technology. It's already built in. That it has a mobile app that the field workers can look at all their work orders and what they need to do. So a work order may look like this, right? So somebody on their mobile device, or in this case, a browser, can pull up 
uh, a list of all the work orders, who needs to work on it. You can put pictures and you can review daily activities. This is the dynamics view. Uh, certainly the view here is much richer. You can drill down and look at more information if you want to. Uh, but certainly the field worker and the dispatchers, they can simply manage all this in the internal portal as well. There's also a mobile app that comes with field services. So the field worker can download the mobile app. They can look at all their work orders, uh, put notes, update um, information, and all that good stuff. And the beauty of this is, as all these updates are being done, the originator, the person who made the request, will get updated as well, what the status is. And that's really, really powerful and uh, effective. And as a citizen, that's something I would really appreciate. So we talked about the basic case management process where a citizen, a user, reports an issue, the government picks it up, looks at it, assigns the work, and the field worker go takes care of it. So that's one part of the solution. The other part is around gaining relevant insights. So in addition to Dynamics 365 and uh, this web front end, there's also a reporting capability that's available. Uh, the reporting solution is powered by uh, embedded Power BI. And again, it's integrated into the portal to make it seamless and easy. For example, you may have key decision makers, the local counselors, the mayors who just want to look at reports. This will be security trimmed when they log in, they'll only see what they're supposed to see and if they only need to see the reports, they can. So this is uh, utilizing embedded Power BI. I think it's still loading here. Let me... And it pulls all the data. By the way, the sample data in this uh, trial environment, uh, we took some sample data from the uh, city of Chicago. I think it's still loading, so let, let's give it a second. But the idea is you can look at the report and be able to slice and dice the data and filter it, all that good stuff. So what kind of information can we find? So for example, we wanna see trending, right? Oh, we get a lot of abandoned building requests. Show me how long or how fast is our response time. Show me outstanding you know, pothole uh, request. So you can see all these trends and understand what's going on in, uh, in your city and what type of issues your constituents are reporting. So all this is through Embedded Power BI. The other fascinating and cool technology that's part of this solution is through the use of the IoT Hub and machine learning of Azure. We've integrated this with the idea that what if we can truly be more proactive? What if we don't have to wait for citizens to report a problem? You know, one statistic uh, that I was reading says that a lot of crimes happen in dark areas, right? So what if we can prevent those by, by just making sure the lights are always available, right? So how can we do that? Through time, we capture all the, the, the data. And so here's an example. We, by the way, you can connect any IoT device. In this example, it's a street light. It could be a parking meter. It could be an elevator. It could be, you know, um, what do you call it? Those temperature IoT devices, Nest and, and what have you. So in this scenario, what we can do is a couple of things, right? So first, I can look at street light status real time if you have IoT device enabled. So looks like everything looks good. And then you can even put in location and the radius. And then second is you can predict failures. And how does this failure, uh, predicting failures work? So what it does, it takes past data, right? If you have, uh, the way we look at this, uh, minimum last three to six months, so you can get solid data and say, okay, in the next, in the date range, right? Between today and June, in the next three months, within five mile radius of this address, how many device will fail? Zero. So if we expand this, the, the radius, it can tell us. So the, the purpose of this, or the benefit of this, once you can kind of have a 
proactive way of understanding which will fail, then you could just send your truck a week before, two weeks before, and do the rounds and change the light bulbs. Everybody with me? That's being proactive. You don't have to wait for people to report. And the other thing, too, is from a procurement perspective, you don't have to stock up a warehouse full of light bulbs because now you can kind of figure out when you need these things just based on machine learning and predictive analytics. The other part that you can take advantage of is if we look at preventive maintenance, you can also specify that instead of proactively going out and changing and fixing the light bulb, you can do proactive maintenance and say, if the IoT device fails, make them self-report. So now there's really three options, right? The citizen's reporting, you do machine learning based predictive analytics, you go fix it before it goes bad, or if it goes bad, make it send a trigger and say, come change my bulb. But then there's more, the, the platform is flexible, there's APIs that taps into things like Waze, there's social listening available that you can, you know, the, the idea is great, but it's challenging because in social, it's, it's really hard to monitor, but you can. You can monitor sentiment, keywords, and see what people are posting on public social media, and based on that, capture some of these input. Um, opportunities are endless. Behind the scenes, under the covers, you know, certainly the way we look at Azure, it's, it's like your Lego blocks of goodness, right? You have all the pieces there to put a solution like this together. And what's really cool about this is whenever we work with government agencies, you know, even before we show this, they would tell me, hey, Ducks, you know, I hear a lot about smart city and bots and AI and machine learning, but I can't picture how it works practically in my city and how I can better serve my citizens with limited budget. Right? But this right here is a possibility. What do you guys think? Helpful so far? Questions? I'd be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Great question. So the question is, since we're being recorded, the question is, in his average city or locale in Denmark, average is about 50,000, right? How long does it take? Does it take, like, is this a six-month project or, you know, two-week project, whatever? So my answer is twofold. Number one, if you're going to build it from the ground up, like what we did, it's going to take a long time, right? And when I say long, you know, if you're well-versed in Azure and whatnot, maybe you take a couple months, yeah? Um, but if you want to just take advantage of, for example, like citizen services, the requirements is it sits on top of Azure Dynamics 365. It bolts on as an app. If there are no existing systems they need to connect to, because the other capability of citizen services is it has open APIs that it can tap to existing systems. Because we know that a lot of government agencies, they have legacy systems that they use. Anybody remember VAX, VMS? You know, for those people looking at me weird, you weren't born yet. I have a lot of government customers, they still use VAX VMS. So if you need to tap into existing legacy systems, so depending on the connectors there, it may take longer. But if it's just fresh out of the box, right? You just, you know, select free trial and then you decide you want to use it and there's no crazy hookups and customization. I mean, you'd be, one, two weeks, you'll be up. It's just a matter of what service you want and what I find, what takes the longest it's not the technology, working with government agencies and saying what services they want, and then they want everything, right? The irony of all this is they have nothing today and suddenly they want, like it's, it's like they're walking today and tomorrow they want a Ferrari, right? So, so that's outside of technology, but the technology itself, and, and I encourage you, by the way, to try this out. Once you go or even now, just hit free trial, play around with it and use it, yeah? But it, it's pretty quick, that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. 
What services? Oh, the technology services. Very good. So, okay, let me break down all the technical. And by the way, I've listed this in the resource as well. So, Azure uh, Compute, we use that service. Um, Azure SQL, IoT Hub, bot services. One thing I didn't mention is it also uses cognitive services. It, we use the visual cognitive services because on the end user app, if you report, let's say that graffiti, I didn't demo it there it, because it's a new release. The citizen can actually put the camera on the graffiti. They don't even have to type it's a graffiti. It'll say, oh, a graffiti detected, correct? Oh, I saw a pothole. It's this big, it's this wide and all that. That's through cognitive services, visual cognitive services. Uh, we use a service bus as well, embedded Power BI. Um, let's see, yeah, and Dynamics 365. Yeah. And those are the major ones. I mean, there, there are little services here and there, but those are the advanced workloads that we use. Yeah? Did that answer your question, sir? Uh, question here? Uh, yeah. I want to ask uh, how you deal with duplicates, uh, du duplicate requests. Is it uh, sold manually or you have something different? Very good question. So it's a great question. The question is, how do you handle duplicate requests, right? In a city, especially if it's large, you know, she saw a pothole, I saw that pothole. Um, Based on the request and the location, especially because most what we find, most of the requests come from the mobile. It's the GPS location getting captured. So it will resolve it. Yeah, there's a logic to say if there's two or three within a certain time period, within a certain radius of a GPS, most likely it's a duplicate. And, you know, it's, it's, it's good enough. I mean, here and there, they still see, but then it learns through time as well. And here's the other cool thing. You know, I talked about the predictive analytics based on things will be broken. But the other part of predictive analytics and machine learning are for other things. So for example, let's say, you know, oh, so here's an example. On a regular basis, it would send a recommendation to the local police saying, you know, you may wanna send like uh, some uh, police to this park around six o'clock. Because in the last three months on this Sunday, Every month, around 6.30, there's always a noise request coming. Some kids are partying in a public space. So you might want to go there 30 minutes earlier to prevent that. Right. What was that Tom Cruise movie? Minority Report? It's already here. Yeah. So, but you could do things like that to, pre to do more preventive things. Not just maintenance, but other types of activities. Yes, sir. It's through, so the great question. The question is, how did you do learning? How would it know if it's going to go bad or not? It's through past data. It's through the past reports. So when people are reporting, we collect, or the system will collect all the data after a certain period of time. I can't remember how long or how much data it needs. And then through that, it will learn. And we just tap into uh, Azure ML for all the uh, capabilities that it offers. Yeah. But it, it needs a certain amount of base set of data to learn. Yes, sir. What about the site? Uh, so, what's the question? What, what do you mean? That's a great question. So, certainly for this specific one, uh, our customers get technical documentation, user guide manual, all that. In fact, I'll, it's all public. I can share it with you. There's a Git, GitHub repo as well. So, if they want to customize them themselves, they could do it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Examples of, of IoT uh, deployments other than uh, the Very good question. Other examples of IoT. So here's at least. Live, live example. Yeah, yeah, live example. So the reality is a lot of the customers we work with are um, small and, and uh, uh, or not small, but cities and, and councils. While the, the smart city idea and IoT idea is great, a lot of them, the initial step into it are lights. I don't have a live example, but there are scenarios. So for example, we're talking to a, a train, public transit train agency, where they have IoT devices on elevators and escalators. So they wanna monitor those. We haven't deployed it yet, but that's one scenario. Um, almost everything now have IoT. So in, in, with this system, it's not limited to lights or elevators. It, it literally taps into the IoT hub. My experience, they're not only limited, but they're 
spread over different departments if this is a cross departmental solution? That's a great question. That's a great question. So the question is, budgets are limited, but not only limited, everybody has their own money, right? So in this story of uh, Richmond, how did they all work together? Government working together? What the city of Richmond did, they created a new agency. That's what governments do, right? If they can't figure it out, create a new agency. They created a new agency called the Department of Citizen Services. So the Department of Citizen Services not only owns a platform, but they are responsible for ensuring providing non-emergency services to the city, so all the related agencies are, are leveraging them. So it's like a shared service model, yeah. Good, uh, let me take, you know, maybe two more questions if they're, yes, sir. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have municipals, we have provinces, uh, the whole country. Uh, can you do data sharing? Like I can imagine I put something in a picture for my city and the city says, oh, hey, this is for the province and they need to come. Sure. Uh, so the question is, can you do data sharing across cities, across states? Absolutely. It just depends on those entities agreeing to do that, right? Uh, we, we're, we're working with another government, uh, it's not a government agency, but they're more of a state. There's, the state is thinking about offering this to the entire state with different cities and councils as like um, a, a global tenant, if you may. And then you have all these other cities so they can share data and whatnot. It can be done. Yeah. Uh, other question. Oh, that's a great question. Did you think of traffic analysis pollution? So we haven't came across that situation, but it's possible because a lot of the devices, again, they're IoT enabled. We can monitor. You, yeah, absolutely. You can use it for pollution tracking, you know, water quality and all that good stuff. What do you guys think? Is this helpful? All right. So, you know, what we've covered today, right, is the reality of citizen services, how government needs to be more proactive, how Azure can provide that capability, and how we did it. Certainly, you know, there's a lot of technical details, and uh, again, I'm gonna share all the resources with you, but I encourage you to try out AppPoint Citizen Services. And a couple of things for you, here are all the resources, and like I said, these, um, the PowerPoint will be available, and I have a lot of corresponding resources that you can take advantage of. Um, the other thing is, uh, here's my contact info, and also, here's a QR code and a link that if you're interested to get these resources, go to the link, put your information, and I'll share these resources with you. In addition, I'll also share my two other sessions later. So. If you're available, I have a session on building a bot in five minutes for Microsoft Teams at 12 o'clock. Uh, build the Microsoft Teams bot in five minutes, 12 o'clock, theater two. And then at two o'clock, I have a session on how to be a rock star presenter. So, you know, a little bit different. Uh, that's part of the diversity and tech track. I wanna share my experience being, you know, how I started as an assembler programmer in the last 16 years, really worked hard to, uh, to uh, work on my presentation skills. So hopefully you can attend that as well. I'll do that. What do you guys think? Is this good, helpful? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so with that, thank you so much, Dankeville, and then uh, enjoy the rest of Microsoft Ignite the tour. Thank you. Thank you.